The Brachistochrone problem is a centuries-old problem that has to do with finding the fastest path a falling object can take. So if a falling object is going from A to B, it is the fastest path that takes it there. And centuries ago, a number of interesting people, scientists, uh, tried to solve this problem, and they all sort of went at it in their own ways. I'm going to talk about Johann Bernoulli's uh, solution to the Brachistochrone problem. I'm going to use a little bit of math, a little bit of coding, and I'm going to show that the Brachistochrone curve can be achieved using light. Johann Bernoulli just solved the problem using some clever mathematics. I'm going to do a bit of that, but I'm going to do a bulk of the problem in some coding. There is a lot of a bit of math to go through and some explanations to go through first, which I'll start with. So let's say you have two points, A and B, and you have some object that's falling, some ball that's rolling or whatever, and you have a bunch of different paths that you can go down. So you could have a straight line, you could have a really extreme line that goes down most of the time and then goes to the right, it's like a blue line. You could have a green line that's like a fun, scary roller coaster where you go down, you do a little loop-de-loop, -loop, and then you go to the end. But those aren't the fastest paths. And the fastest path is actually something a little bit like this red line here. All the other paths are not the fastest. The fastest path is called the Brachistochrone curve, or aptly named <laughs> curve. Uh, and this is the fastest path that you can take to get from point A to point B if you were to roll down some slope. So let's now talk about two ways of getting the Brachistochrone curve. So the Brachistochrone curve is actually part of a cycloid. Now to make a cycloid, you just take a little circle, which I cut out of cardboard, uh, very crafty. So you poke a little hole on the edge, so right on the edge, I'm just about at the edge, and you were to carefully move the circle without slipping. I, I messed it up. Okay, let's try this again. Let's see if chemistry will help us out this time. All right, so this is the Brachistochrone curve. So this is the fastest path. So if this, let's say it rolls down this way, A, B, this is the fastest path that you can take to get there the fastest, to get from point A to point B the fastest. And it comes out of just this little piece of cardboard here, this little piece of circle. And you can also derive the equations of this Brachistochrone uh, with some math which I'm not going to do in this video because it's been done elsewhere, and I'll link to those videos in the description if you're interested. So it is this cycloid-derived Brachistochrone curve that I'm going to use to check the sort of simulation that I make of the Brachistochrone with light. I will revisit this later on in the video. So this is Snell's law here. It's n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. n is the index of refraction, so that's just c over v. C is the speed of light of light in a vacuum, and V is the speed of light in the medium here. So this could be air, this could be water, this could be glass or something, any material that is that light can travel through. So this is a light ray here. So a light ray travels through the medium at some angle from, this is called the normal line, so this line just perpendicular to the, these parallel lines. So what Snell's law allows you to do is if you have light traveling through a medium and it enters a new medium, you can calculate theta 2, this new angle that it makes with the normal, just very simply by rewriting this equation uh, and plugging it into a calculator or whatever, and you can find that angle really easily. And you can keep doing that every new medium it goes into. So here we have Snell's law. So I can change this to be... So this is the same equation as this. I just canceled out the C's because I don't want to deal with them. But we have these two equations here. No, one equation. This is one equation. So if you have a bunch of different mediums, you know, going on for infinity or whatever, a bunch of different mediums, n1, n2, and on, you can write an equation something like this. So this is that same equation but extended. Sine theta 1 over v1 is equal to sine theta 2 over v2, which is also equal to sine theta 3 over v3 and so on and so forth, until sine theta n over vn, where n is just the number, the total number of mediums that the light is going through. It's all the same. They're all equal, which is the very powerful thing about Snell's law. So what we can write here is we could set any of these sine thetas over v's equal to the very last one, so this one here. So sine theta i over vi is any of these proportions 
before the final one. And we could set that equal to the final one. It's that simple. And this is actually very important and will simplify things greatly uh, in just a minute. So one of the things Snell's Law shows us is that light takes whichever path takes the least amount of time to get where it's trying to go. And it was the principle that led Johann Bernoulli to investigate using light in order to get the brachistochrome curve. So theta n and vn are the final angle and the final speed of light. If I could stop right here, this would have theta n and vn in there. So that's just corresponding to the final set of theta and vn. So it's important to note that if the light ray is going down like this and the n is increasing as you go down, then the light ray will approach this normal line. The next theta will be smaller. So theta two is smaller than theta one. So it approaches that normal every time. So theta one can start out anywhere from zero degrees up to 90 degrees or zero to pi over two. And if you kept going with a bunch of different mediums that increased, then it would eventually approach the medium. It would eventually go just straight down. But it won't go past straight down. Because if you looked at Snell's law, if you plug in sine of zero, that's just zero. So if theta one is zero, that's just zero. And then solve that, theta two is zero, and so on. And the same goes for if n decreases, then the light ray will approach this uh, parallel line here. In that case, it's still going from zero to pi over two if you're measuring from the normal. So basically what I'm trying to say is that theta can only be from zero to pi over two. That's the only range possible of thetas for light rays traveling uh, through mediums here. This theta n will eventually, as long as you have enough mediums that you're going through, it will eventually approach pi over two. So we can simplify this. So now I have this equal to sine of pi over two over Vn, which is just one. And then we have, that's just one over Vn. So sine of the angle is equal to Vi over Vn. Vn is just the final speed or the maximum speed that the light can go. Vi is just any of the previous ones. So this is very powerful because all we need is Vi. We know Vn, we can just calculate that. That's the same for any of the thetas. We can calculate all the thetas we want very, very easily. So in order to get the brachistochrome curve with this, we need to introduce some falling aspect to this system because right now it's just we have light going through mediums, but we need to connect it in some way to the sort of falling ball or the falling sphere or whatever along the path. And we could do that just by looking at conservation of energy. So if we have a ball just falling, we can actually find the speed at any of these points. So this is just conservation of energy. There's the potential energies at the beginning and the end, and the kinetic energies at the beginning and the end, just neglecting rotational, just if it's falling. And VI is just zero. So it just starts at zero meters per second, miles per hour, whatever. And then you can cancel out the Ms, and you can solve for VF. So after a little bit of work, you can get this equation, which we can simplify even further. If we say YI is zero, it's a, so it starts at zero, and then increases or decreases from there, then that's zero, and this simplifies to 2GYF, where, uh, again, YF, well, not again, but YF is less than zero in this case, or just ignore that, basically is what I like to do, square root of 2GYF, you know, YF is just the, the height, the fallen height, positive fallen height of the object. So yeah, we have the final velocity of the ball, or whatever the object is, is equal to the square root of two times g, which is the gravitational constant, times h, which is just the fallen height. So if it goes some amount, that's the fallen height, it's positive. This is a useful equation. It tells us that the speed of the object as it's falling, and no matter what path that it goes down, without friction, it's just dependent upon the height. So for an object falling from point A to point B, in the case of the brachistochrone, that is the speed of the object. So we can use this equation for the speed of the object with the Snell's law equation that we created over here to introduce that falling aspect. So I could just set that equal to, so I square root of 2g little h, which is the height fallen, divided by the square root of 2g capital H. That's just the maximum height. So however far it falls at the end of the thing, uh, end of the scenario, that's the maximum height it can fall. And you can simplify this even further nice little quantity here. So now it tells us the angle relative to the normal at any of the mediums that the light is going through is equal to the square root of the height 
that it goes divided by the total height. And it's that simple. We can use this equation to get the brachistochrone, and that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to show that this using this equation yields to the same result as we did with the cycloid. So a quick overview of the system here. So we have a bunch of different mediums, uh, N1, N2, N3, all with a velocity characteristic. And that'll go down big N times. So that's just a really, really big number of mediums. And then little d here, that is the width of the medium. So it's going to be really, really small. Then you have the light ray traveling along here. It's approaching this parallel line just because of what N is defined to be. So for theta 1, if you're inside this medium, height is equal to d. And if it's in the next medium, it's equal to 2d. It's just quantified, quantized here in this way. Uh, I need to do this because I can't say y equals 0. I can't say y equals 0 because with the square root of h over h, you get 0. And then the sine of theta equals 0 and theta equals 0 which is, means nothing's going to happen. So you can't have y equals 0. We can have y equals d. So that's just where I'm going to start and go down, increasing to 2d, 3d, and so on. Big n number of times, a really large number of mediums, a really small separation. So v, the speed of light in the mediums, actually increases as you go down because it's square root of 2g little h, and little h is increasing. So that's going to go up. Index of refraction is actually going to go down. And so that's why it's approaching this parallel line here instead of the normal line. I want to further note the importance of this, the fact that d must approach 0 and n must approach infinity. So basically, d has to be small and n must be big. Basically, we can't do these in code, so we just have to do our best and approximate. So what we have so far is we have the angles in each medium, which is really all we need in order to calculate everything we want. So let's say theta 1 is equal to sine inverse of d over h square root, next one's 2d over h square root, and so on and so forth. It's very, very simple, just dependent upon h. So you can find the y positions. First it's d, then it's 2d, then it's 3d, and so on and so forth, all the way to the end, nd. If you want to find x at a certain medium, so the amount that it's moving in the x direction, that's just little d times the tangent of theta. You can find that just with some trigonometry. It's very simple. So if you're coding this yourself, which I recommend trying because it's actually a really interesting and fun challenge. This is all the information that you need in order to simulate it. We're going to need the equations of the cycloid, which are, you can find these. I'm not going to do it in this video because it's been done elsewhere. So that work's already been done. So I will use these equations in the code to calculate the cycloid. So that's just this. So if this circle is moving in a straight line, these equations represent the coordinates of that point. So I'm going to use these equations in my code in order to check the light Snell's law way of finding the brachistochrone to make sure that it's right. And I didn't say, but this is the radius, and this is the angle, sort of the rotation angle. So if that's zero degrees, then if you turn that much, that's pi over two. <laughs> and then that's pi, and then all the way around, and it's 2 pi. So that's just that angle right there. It will also be important to define what r will be uh, to make the different solutions sort of comparable. That'll make more sense in just a little bit. So we want r, the radius, to be equal to d times n over 2. Uh, so d is the separation, and n is the number of mediums, divided by 2. We want that to be r. All right, so here I am in Python. First time in Python, or in any language you need your, your packages. I just chose NumPy and matplotlib. So those are just for sines and cosines and plotting and stuff. Okay, so in the beginning we have X and Y, capital X and capital Y. I'll, I'll get back to that and explain what that is. Now we have little d. That's gonna be really small. So what I did is I just did 0 0.01 divided by some scale factor. So down a little bit, Ignore this circle function because I was trying to figure out circles and maybe I'll figure it out for plotting later. So we have this theta function. Now that's just the sine theta equals v over vm, uh, vmax, the, the equation I showed just before. I uh, just put this into a function. You have vm, which is the maximum uh, speed at the bottom. That's just going to be the square root of 2 times g, 9.81, times the 
height limit. So that's big H. Regular V is just square root of 2G H. H is the height. Then you have angle theta, which is just the inverse sine of that. And then I return that. I ignore that because circles in Python and plots are so frustrating. <laughs> now this is the main function. So first I have this block of stuff. That's the first layer. So first the fallen height, I call it. It's D at first. So that's just whatever D is, 0 0.01 divided by three. You calculate theta one. So that's the first theta. That's the first angle. And you plug in the current fallen height, which is D, and the height limit, which I will specify later on. So that calculates the first theta, theta one. So the light ray goes on to the next medium. So I want to iterate D. So that's where the plus equals D comes from. That just adds D to the, the height. And then X dot append, D times tangent theta one. That is D times tangent theta is just the X uh, sort of displacement at each step. Uh, I just put that in a list. Now I want to loop over all the layers that are left after the first one. So while fallen height is less than equal to the height limit, that just makes sure that you don't go more than the total height that you can go down. And then we calculate the theta at that step, the angle with respect to the normal at that step, or at that medium. Calculate the x displacement again. Put that in a list to deal with later. So big N is, so it starts out at one because I've already done one trial. And then for each New trial, I add one. So I use that to define the y's. Uh, now that I think about it, n might be equal to layers, but I'm too lazy to find out. So I'm just gonna leave it there. So that loops over all the mediums left after the first one, all the way until you get to the bottom. Uh, it does all the mediums. And after all that is done, return the angle, uh, the final angle, which I'm not sure if I really needed that for anything. I just printed it out later on. Actually, so that might not be necessary. Uh, I want to print that out. Then big N, give it to that, which I use to make my Y. So here, the layers, that's the number of layers, the number of mediums, which I just do 100 times that scale factor. And so it's going to get bigger if the scale factor is bigger. And then now we got to make the X and Y stuff that we're going to plot. X is already made, but it's a list, so this just turns it into an array. So capital Y is the coordinates of the light as it goes down. It's very simple. It's a lot simpler than X because Y always goes down D each time it goes on to the next medium. It always goes down D. So all you need to do is make an array of ones, so that would be like, that's not right, one, 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 etc. And then you just multiply by D. That's not the Y coordinate yet because Obviously, that would mean it's not moving at all, which that doesn't make sense. And that's the purpose of this boy here. So what this does is it takes the current element in the array, adds the next element, and sets that equal to the next element. So that's basically just an essential step that I need to take before I actually plot x and y. So now we plot it. I plotted y comma x. Normally, you do x comma y. I just swapped them because I wanted it to have the right orientation to be like that. You'll see it in just a minute. Otherwise, it look not quite right just with the orientation. It's right, but it just the orientation doesn't look right. So that's a simulated brachistochrone. But now we got to make the cycloid. Now remember that the cycloid goes from 0 to pi. Light can only go 0 to pi over 2. Theta initial would be 0. Theta final would be pi. So here I just use a lin space, which just creates an array of numbers between 0 and pi. I'm going to plug that into these equations here, which are the equations for the cycloid, which I showed you just a bit ago, which gets me the x and the y for the cycloid. And now, like I mentioned before, r is d times n over 2. Okay, That'll make it so they're comparable, so I can plot them on the same graph. And a bunch of other things to ignore because I don't need them. And then I do the same plotting, swap the x and y. And that's the exact brachistochrone, the cycloid-derived brachistochrone, as I call it. So now I add some labels and a title. The actual Y coordinate is on the X axis, but then I just swapped the X axis. So instead of going from zero to 3000 or whatever it goes to, it goes from 3000 to zero. I just wanted to swap it so it looked right. And so that's everything. And then I can run it, run it again, and you can see it's going to go until it gets to about pi over 2. There you go. 
and it looks like that, which doesn't look quite right, which probably means our scale factor is not big enough. So let's do five. Okay, so here we have it. As you see, the blue right here, that's the simulated Bakrista Chrome. That's like the big line. And then the orange line, that's sort of the smaller, uh, less width line, is the exact Bakrista Chrome. That's the cycloid that I plotted. As you can see, they are exactly the same. Like, they are right on top of each other, which is wonderful. Um, you can see, I believe this is the right orientation for the cycloid or for the brachistochrone. So if you were to drop a, a ball at the top here and let it roll all the way down from point A to B, this is the fastest path. So remember, the orange is the cycloid. So that's literally from drawing, you know, putting a little pencil at the edge of a circle and then drawing that line. And the blue is from light, Snell's Law. Uh, so there's a, a very strange and weird connection that some very clever people, well, Johann Bernoulli centuries ago, figured out uh, that connection there, which is actually very, very cool. So there was the Brachistochrone curve found using light and Snell's Law, uh, as well as a circle, basically a rolling circle. But yeah, so that was the whole point of this video at this point. So that's all I have for this video. I'll have links in the description to other resources if you're interested in learning more. A bunch of videos. Uh, there's a lot of great videos on YouTube, like from Vsauce and 3Blue1Brown. Those are a couple examples. They're really fantastic videos about the Berkistochrone. Um, it's a very difficult word to say. Um, so if you haven't seen those videos, I would recommend checking them out because they're really great. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, I'd appreciate it if you gave it a like, if you want. And if you want to see more videos like this, you can subscribe obviously. But that's all I have in this video.